We're going to dive deep into some serious science tonight. But as you might expect, in an ocean full of wondrous life, all you're going to get is the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week, we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekiverse. We'll do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode is my noodly sea life appendage, Mike Kafis. I'll keep my tardigrade trap shut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and on this episode, we are talking with Dr. Jennifer Biddle. Hi. Jennifer Biddle is a micro microbial, I, I know it's going to screw this up, is a microbial ecologist who is an associate professor at the University of Delaware in their School of Marine Science and Policy. She researches funky microbes. You know, when I was reading this the first time, I thought, I was like, it made me want to do it like Randy Savage, you know, like, like, uh, you know, research is funky microbes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, but in all sorts of places, from deep into the earth to local waterways, she's been to the bottom of the ocean and walked under it, all in the name of science, which is awesome. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. All right. Happy to, ha happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So if you all are, you know, watch our shows religiously, you will have seen uh, Jennifer on the science panel show that we did this summer. Um, I can't remember what episode that was, Mike, like 630, 628, 629, something like that. Um, yeah. But uh, we, we we had such a good time on that panel and, and Jennifer was so bright. I mean, every time she opened her mouth, she said something smart. So I was like, we got to have her on the show. Hey. You guys, I mean, I didn't realize there's gonna be an astronaut on the panel, yeah. so it was really just a little bit of trying to save some face that like the kids thought I was somewhat cool at all. So, yeah, yeah. that was what I called my like when I thought I was gonna do something fun, and oh crap, they put an astronaut on the panel. Right, <laughs> right. I think we felt. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was a good time though. Awesome. Yeah, it was. It was. So, um, so you know, Mike. Jennifer does something that is 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 dear to my heart. You have you raise backyard chickens. I do, I do. Although not too successfully right now. We just had one die the other day. Oh no! But life happens. Thankfully, it was actually a natural death. Um, we unfortunately learned about a lot of predators. Uh, we've had fox attacks. We've had raccoons eat all their food. Uh, we've had hawks come in. The neighbor's dog, yeah, snakes. Yeah, there was a big rat snake this summer that was eating all the eggs. Oh and yeah, God. it's amazing what you have to learn to deal with, especially after growing up in more of a, I thought I grew up in a rural area, but it turns out it was really hardcore suburbia. Right. Um, where I never saw a snake growing up, growing up, and now we live in the country. So it's like, whoo, hey, just yeah. gotta get used to dealing with big rat snakes. So. And you know, you know what else is interesting is uh, I've seen some stuff, done some reading on. The, um, they they put some surveillance cameras up, and they found that cities actually have populations of like wolves and foxes and coyotes coming into the cities, and people don't realize it because they come in like super late, like three o'clock, four o'clock, and they rummage around and then they go hide. And when people would see them, uh, they think they're dogs, right? They just think they're like a stray dog or whatever. Yeah, I would not be surprised because it's hard to tell when it's really, and you're not used to seeing them, right? It's, yeah. it's hard to tell if you go by quickly. So, and yeah. I live, I live just behind in, in the woods between me and Morgan um, University and um, in, in Baltimore City. And it is a, this is a very, I mean, this is really in the heart of the city, but there is just a slight wooded area between, you know, the back of their property and our property. And I, I see deer. If I go out and I, I'll go out and take some laundry down to the basement or do some other things, and I'll see deer running around and um, all, you know, possum and or opossum, if you will. And uh, <laughs> oh, possum. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I've always had a thing for chickens. I don't know. And, and uh, Mike, remember my girlfriend, Tracy, uh, John's sister? One time she yes. bought me two chickens because I had this thing for chickens. She bought me two little chickens, two chicks. I named them Frickin' Frack. But I had to get rid of them because I, I was only like 19. I didn't have to take care of chickens. And I lived in the city, so I wound up having to give them away to somebody. But they were so cute. <laughs> yeah, no, we, um, we started, I don't know, on a whim, I guess. And part of it was that we lived in this area that let you have them. And so I, and, and I live in Delaware, so Delaware is the chicken state. And we just kind of had to embrace it. And um yeah, it's been nice. And it's, I feel like it's also a little bit of, um, it satisfies my, my like prepper part of my nature. Like mm -hmm. I'm not a super prepper. Like we don't have any sort of like 
basement hideaway for radiation shelter or anything. Right. But it's like nice to know that like if everything goes through and that big EMP comes out and just decimates everything, like we're gonna have protein from the backyard for a couple right. months. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Oh, nice. This also means I have rooster issues in that I hate the rooster. I really want to get rid of it, but it does make the babies, so it right. stayed for a while, but yeah. He says, yeah. He says I say, I, I say, boy, you're, you're sharp as a baseball. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you said you had a flock. Uh, I asked Google, what is the, you know, to find the number of a flock, and even Google couldn't tell me this. So where do you sit with where uh, how many constitutes a flock of, of chickens? Um, or like birds? two, I think, is fair. But they're, I mean, they're real social creatures, so we try to keep at least four to five hens at any one time. Um, so right now we're in a stage of like the older flock is kind of passing on and we've got what, like four hens in the old batch and then we just got four new ones. Um, so they're going to grow up and when they have to be the same size, we can combine them. So we'll condense down to one flock, but I guess now that we have two. So. Hmm. All right. Well, enough about chickens. We're here to talk about um, micro microbiomes and such. Um, mm -hmm. And so you know, I was looking through your page and looking through some of the videos and stuff you had on there uh, or and that you'd link to, and you do a bit of ocean exploration. Um, and and I, I've gone scuba diving a couple of times. How deep have you have you dove? How, how deep have you gone? Um, okay, so there, well, how deep I've been in the ocean is about 2,000 meters, mm. uh, and that was in the HOV Alvin, so the Human Occupied Vehicle Alvin, and it's one of the deep submergence tools that the U.S. has for exploration. Uh, and so that was, I'd done that in the Gulf of California, also known as the Sierra Cortez, and we went to see the hydrothermal vents there. Uh, so it was an awesome experience. And then I was also uh, probably about 1,800 meters. I'm trying to remember if it was meters. I think it was meters because it was in England. Um, I mentioned walking around the bottom of the ocean. It was really cool. I got to go into a mine in England, and we dropped down to an ancient seabed, actually. So the Jektein Sea used to exist between Britain and Germany. Mm -hmm. And it's, it dried up, formed the salt layer, and they're mining it basically as a potash mine where they're getting calcium chlorides and other salts, and it's used from everything from industrial purposes to road salts for icing. Uh, and we actually were doing some research down there, and so got to go and walk under the North Sea, which was pretty cool to pretty drop cool. down into this, you know, mining borehole, and then um, you walk along this salty road, and then you get to a sign, and it's like, land ends here, and after that, you just walk under the sea. Wow, that's neat. Yeah, there was there was actually a tragedy um, in one town where there was a salt mine under a, 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 a lake and something happened and I think they punched hole through the top of it and destroyed the salt yeah. mine, right? Is it, isn't that, and the whole lake too, so everything. This is, this is when you want to like trust your geologist because, you know, salt is not super structurally sound. Um, and it was crazy because in this mine, we went to an area where actually the salt had started collapsing. And um, they had these wooden supports that were sort of like imagine Jenga blocks stacked up on top of each other. And they just sort of stick it in this like cave and then like, they're like, okay, we think we're good. And they walk out and then you come back in years later and you find that these, these pieces of wood have just compressed like pancakes. Oh, wow. And yeah, and so the whole salt structure is compressing. So the mining engineers, it was amazing like how much they do to make sure things were good. But one of the reasons we were down there was to actually bring like NASA quality technology and this idea of using robotics to explore things. But this thought of like, you could go use drones to do those exploration surveys in those closed areas of the mine instead of risking someone being in there and then something happened. Um, so yeah, so it was really interesting to think about. And uh, what was really cool is how much water actually flows under the earth. Mm -hmm. So we think about water, we usually think about like groundwater. We think about what we might drink in terms of an aquifer, but there's actually water flowing even deeper down. Um, and so even there, there were like flows of water happening in between the layers of salt and mud. Oh. And so this is like way, way behind the ocean. So it was crazy because every once in a while they'd like poke a hole and then there'd be water coming out. So we actually wrote a paper on it because microbes would grow. And so it was really interesting because depending on which water you tested, um, one of the waters had no microbes growing in it. And so it was this idea that there's the ionic balance is just so off that, that nothing can live in it. Whereas a lot of the other salts were actually fine. Microbes can go in really salty places. So it was a really a neat uh, experience to go through. So That's what type of microbes did you guys find down there? 
Uh, I can't remember exactly at this point, but there's um, a bunch of salt loving microbes. And so they're called lovely, you know, descriptive titles like Halophilus. Um, I think there's a halo anaerobium there. So that's something that doesn't like oxygen and live, loves salt. Uh, so lots of just funky organisms that we do see in salty places at the surface, but that they're growing deep in the spine also. Wow. Okay. That's really, that's, yeah. that's awesome. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, in your bio, you talked about, you know, uh, talked about how, uh, microbes that, that live into the center of the earth. Now you weren't talking about like in the center of the earth, right? I mean, you mean, but like, like, like they go pretty deep. How deep can they go? Like how? How deep can microbes live? Do we know? So right now, the current theory that is on that is that um, you can keep them going until it gets too hot. So obviously, the mantle is super hot. And I'm sure you thought you'd be discussing the center of the Earth today, right? But that we have no. um, <laughs> different levels of the mant mantle. And we think about there's an area called the moho. So there is a seismic discontinuity that describes the upper reaches of the mantle, basically a stenosphere. Um, and there's no reason to think that it can't li live to that long, as long as there's room to grow, um, as long as there's water, and as long as it doesn't get too hot. So one of the current estimates that's out there in the literature is they take um, an isotherm about 120 degrees Celsius, so they make guesses about where that's gonna sit, uh, and it turns out that they can go pretty deep. So at least wow. um, a kilometer or two, depending on how long it takes to get hot, depending on where you are on Earth. Right, right. You know, a lot of people don't realize that when you, when you dig down deep enough, I mean, it starts getting really hot. Like you yeah, don't even so have to get close to like the the mantle or anything. You start going down a few thousand feet and it starts getting really hot. Yeah. So even like the deep gold mines in South Africa, the Bulby mine that we were in in England, like they are warm when you get down there. So it's already getting pretty toasty. Um, the Bulby mine was just like a hot Florida day. It wasn't that bad. It does make an interesting thing when they tell you there's no bathrooms. Um, so you want to hydrate to stay well, you know, to stay hydrated in the warm weather and, and not be, you know, re replacing the sweat that you're losing, but then not overhydrate because there's no bathrooms in it. Right. Hmm. Yeah. So Paul Nunes was asking this, and it's a great it's kind of a segue into uh, have you uh, encountered in your own research any extreme files? Like, have you been able to study them up close? Oh, yeah. And we actually, well, okay, so we're doing a fun study right now. Um, some of it, which is published now, but some of it's going to start keep coming out is, uh, actually I, and I did a talk recently about extremophiles in your backyard. So it turns out that a lot of the organisms that we've labeled as extremophiles have cousins and relatives that aren't totally extreme, right? It's kind of like the people that don't drink Mountain Dew on the holidays. <laughs> um, and so we did a cool study actually just looking at stuff in shallow Delaware waters. And it turns out we do get relatives of what people consider to be super extreme things that we thought we had to go to the bottom of the ocean to study. But it turns out you can just walk, you know, I walk into basically my backyard at work and, and they're living out there too. Um, we also have other things that we've uh, gotten growing in lab. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, how do you take something that's really deep and under a lot of pressure, but then how do you coax it out into living in the laboratory and messing with conditions? So we've got some interesting results right there that aren't published yet, um, but it turns out there's a lot of things that we thought were like super, like super extreme would have to be super really hard to grow. You need some super funky bioreactor or something like that. And it turns out they're growing in relatively normal setups. What we changed was actually the chemistry around them. And then they're happy and they start growing. Huh. Are there any extremophiles that are able to either desalinize or decalcify water? Um, so desalinize, not really. Um, decalcify, it depends. So um, if we think about, there's microbes that can actually take calcium carbonate and then um, form it into rock. So that's something that we've worked on actually in some lakes in British Columbia in looking at this um, induction of making carbonate. So in that way, it's pulling the calcium, and the carbonate out of the water. Uh, what's interesting is that in that system, we still think it's actually more of a chemical process that the microbes aren't necessarily um, forcing that to happen. They're changing the local chemistry and then the chemistry induces the precipitation uh, of calcium. Okay. All right. So they're like a catalyst. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So, you know, in reading um, through your page and stuff, and, I, and I'm, I keep coming across this term, and I know it's, it's another type of life. It's called archaea, which most people are not very familiar with. I'm not super familiar with it. I mean, I know it's, it's not a bacteria. It's not an animal. It's not a plant. What in the hell is an archaea? All right. So great question, right? So they're about as old as I am, right? They were um, discovered because basically we thought they're these single-celled creatures, and we thought everything was a bacterium. And then we started looking at what the sequences of these things were, and it turns out they didn't match up to bacteria at all. Um, 
So now established as its own domain of life and that domain of life keeps growing because it turns out people thought these were like super funky organisms that only lived in really special places. That idea went out the window in the early 2000s. These things are ubiquitous. Um, they live everywhere. And basically they're, they're single celled organisms. They're just like bacteria, except they have different types of membranes. And then they have a little bit different genetic material in terms of how they work. Um, there's some recent studies that actually suggest that if we think about like how like eukaryotes, if you guys are familiar with eukaryotes, right? So we're eukaryotes, we have cells and inside the cells there's these mitochondria. Right. So there's a big question of where that came from. And so there's some new research that's suggesting that that proto cell might've been an archaean and then it swallowed an, a bacterium, which is the mitochondria um, because we're t t mapping basically all of the genetic signatures we have and trying to figure out what would have happened way back when in terms of what signatures are now left in the relatives that we have in the modern. Okay, because um, I had always thought of that as a bacteria had swallowed something or, or merged with something to create the mitochondria, but it's looking like it's archaea that ate, ate or absorbed or whatever. No, nah, kind we of, don't really. I mean, no, 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 I but I mean, tell my students, I wasn't there and right, you weren't, so we don't right. know exactly what happened. Sure, but, but, but yeah, but that's like a theory? The, rel the, the remnants that's in the genome suggest that it could have been an archaean being the sort of progenitor um, protocell. So I like to think that we're archaea. Right, that we're majority archaea and that we're just we've just bastardized the bacteria to be our mitochondria and make us energy. Take that no, bacteria. No. <laughs> archaea, that's a, there's a one sec uh, section that's protists, right? Is that the So protists are bigger. So protists are already eukaryotes. Right. So archaea are, are single cell just like bacteria. Yeah. Um, and so this is actually a really interesting like educational dilemma right now because what you're thinking about with prote protists or you're thinking about monera, protista, and like those sort of five or five kingdoms, right? Right. That's still taught in textbooks, it's still taught in schools, but the the current knowledge in terms of the way biologists are talking about it is we talk about the three domains. So we said there's bacteria, archaea, and then eukaryotes. So all of that like monera, protista crap all flow falls into eukaryotes in general. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, so it's interesting though how like standards and everything with textbooks haven't haven't gone back to talking about these other things. Um, and I will say that the data that suggests that archaea might be these progenitors, it's still under a lot of debate. We don't have that many data points right now, um, but it is intriguing. Like the evidence is building, and I feel like in the next ten years we'll get a lot better idea of which way it's going to swing. Awesome, that is really cool. And and that's, I saw something about you were studying Asgard archaea, which is kind of cool because like this show we're like all into like nerd stuff, and apparently you know that they get you got the Loki and, and the Hydra vents. And uh, tell me about yeah. tell me about the Asgard so, archaea. What what makes them so cool? So the Asgard archaea are actually these ones that we think are the progenitors of eukaryotes. Um, and what's cool is that uh, they like the way we talk about phylogenetics, right? So how the gene sequences stack up next to each other. And when people first looked at them, they realized they branched really deeply. So they do look really ancestral. Um, and so, yeah, so they started getting names and it's, yeah, it's one of these things like we knew that they existed years ago, but we gave them an, like a letter name and we knew they were funky, but we didn't make a big deal out of it. And then I think it was 2012 ish. So people started publishing it and they named the first one Loki for this Loki's castle region, which is a hydrothermal vent system. Um, bottom of the ocean, and so it's like, oh, this is the Loki Archaea because we found it at Loki's castle. And then um, the next one got named Thor. And so I was actually the editor, I think I was the editor in the Thor Archaeota paper, and I asked the authors to promise that the next would be named Iron Man Archaeota. Mm -hmm. um, turns out my opinion doesn't matter in science, and so the last next one's got named, we have, we have Odin Archaeota now, we have Heimdall Archaeota. Um, I think there's a Hell Archaeota. So we're running through Thor's family, right? right. Um, and we need so, Sif. More Marvel Arcadia. Yeah, right. so I have been debating because we actually have a new lineage that we want to name. And so I've been debating if I should just kind of start, you know, go through Marvel and, you know, we'll yeah. start naming them new things. And yeah. I think Iron Man Archaeota works, um, but no one in science seems to appreciate that idea right now. <laughs> Avenger Archaea. Avenger <laughs> Archaea <laughs> symbol. <No. laughs> right. That was a good one. That's that a good one. Good. All right. Yeah. So another thing you're doing, uh, another one of your things you're doing, you're turning bacteria, bacterial diversity into a song. Well, what? What? <laughs> what does that mean? Sometimes strange things happen. Um, but no, okay. So there's been um, a lot of discussion lately about ways to better think about data, right? And when you have a lot of contextual data, like how can you describe it? And I mean, it's sort of hard to, to think about it. But if you think about um, describing like 
the diversity you see. And if I described like three different habitats, if I described like the Arctic tundra, a grassland savanna, and then like the rainforest, you immediately know that like the rainforest is so much richer in biodiversity and as an ecosystem has a lot more going on than something like an Arctic tundra. Um, but can you represent that in another way? And so I started working with these collaborators. So we're working with, um, I'm trying to remember his uh, title. He's like a professor of digital media, I think is his title. Um, and it's interesting because he basically one of his challenges is like, can I use other things to interpret data in other ways that are more richer and contextual? Because like a human being, when they look at a graph, is like you either see like two or three colors or you see like a bunch. And the hard thing is like, what does a bunch mean, right? Like, is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? And the human, like when you see those kinds of graphs, you actually can't tell that much. It's just, you say it's a lot. Um, so could you use something like sound to better indicate complexity? And if you think about like, again, like thinking about like the way that recording has changed, right? With this idea of like the wall of sound coming through and was it like the forties, fifties, um, that sound got much richer and we have the ability to then record multiple channels. And so could we use that to then describe how things are going? So that project is still ongoing. We have a couple of, um, of initial songs out because one of the other things we were doing is trying to see if we could um, like take protein sequences and like listen to a protein sequence so that you could start ascertaining if there's sort of a pattern or a, a special signature about it. Okay. Um, and part of this comes back to like, other ideas in biology that if you, like let's say you're doing cancer screenings in a pathology lab, um, if you could convert that to data, like your eye might miss something, but your ear probably won't. That you'll uh -huh. actually be better tuned in to like, or if you heard them together, you would notice something different quicker. Right. Um, so if you could take like a pathology slide and then make that into music, you would better get that. Um, so I don't know, oh, I just heard music, is that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, we're going into that idea and the idea is again, to give people a good contextual idea of the complexity of the ocean. So again, if we talk about like what's going on in the water column or I love when I like get students in my class cause I'm like, who here has experienced the ocean and like everyone puts their hands up and I start asking questions about like, who's been more than a mile offshore, right? And like most of the hands go down, you know, who's been out into the gyre, all the hands go down. Um, hmm. And like, who's been to the bottom of the ocean and my hand's the only one that stays up, right? And this idea, like the ocean is this 3D place and how can you really appreciate what's going on? And so for example, if you think about like the ocean around Antarctica, you might think like, oh, there's not much going on there, but there's a lot going, there's on. A lot going on there, especially if we think of what's going on in the water column. Um, so could we use sound to kind of give you an idea of that 3D structure of the water column in different areas? Um, and then we actually, we just gave our collaborators this data set that we generated where for other reasons, fun fact, sometimes in oceanography, you do what you can. Um, and so we had a boat that basically sat at one place in the Atlantic Ocean for about a week and a half. Um, and my very industrious student just started taking samples of the water column every day. And it turns out not many people have done that because of course they have to go like cover the entire ocean. So they'll move the boat more quickly. And so in just covering the same sample, the, you know, day after day for a week straight, we actually saw that there were these sort of pulses of things that happened during the week. And so we're trying to put that into sound also to then basically give you an idea of like, what would it look like if you just sat on the porch of the ocean at the spot in the Atlantic and then like watched it for a week of what's going by. Um, and yeah, like day after day, like day one and two might sound really similar, but when you hit day three, you're going to start being like, oh wait, there's something going on in day three that sounds a little bit different. And you'll notice that basically we think that's, can't remember exactly what the theory was now if a storm was coming through there's a little bit of mixing occurring and that there's something going on deep in the water column huh can i ask is there anywhere the public can go and hear some of this the the samples of this yeah so um i feel bad i shouldn't like be like googling while you guys are talking about That's it fun. um i know the one got released i think it's on youtube now um the my collaborator is tim weaver at the university of denver and so i know if you look on tim's website he's got links to the protein sound um, and he, we are starting our own website for it, but it's not necessarily built out yet. Um, but you know, we can keep people, uh, informed on that. Cause that project is sort of just finishing up right. right now. Hopefully before you, before we hang up tonight, if we can try and get a link, I'd like to leave it in our show description so people okay. can, um, get a link and listen to it. Cause that sounds fascinating. Hey Mike, All you right. know, you know, also have in Delaware, that's really, uh, that's really popular in Delaware. As a matter of fact, I went up there the other weekend for it. 
uh, the Delaware, um, the the Lewis Library. No, it's very nice. oh, no, no, that's nice too. Yeah, yeah. No, the Apple Scrapple Festival. Oh, oh man, you went to Apple Scrapple? I did. I went. To, I love Scrapple. I went to Apple Scrapple. It's a thing. Yeah. Did yeah. you get the um? Oh, what are they? The uh, Apple. Um, uh, oh man. What are it's like a dessert, like a fritter type of thing or whatever it was. Uh, fritter, no, I didn't get yeah. one because my daughter. My daughter Apple wanted strudel, I think it's called. Strudel, yeah, oh she God, wanted to leave. So she was like, oh. it was hot and it was crowded. Uh, and they said it was actually much more crowded this year than the last couple of years. And um, yeah, she, she made me leave before I could get one of those. But I really wanted one. I did get some apples, though, and they were really good. Good for her. Good for her. And I had a nice scrapple Damn. sandwich. Oh, it was delicious. Oh. Mike ate scrapple. <laughs> so i hope you know that like my husband is very proud of this story because he like the biddle family was big in philadelphia and apparently like way back when like the british used to come over and like try to figure out what's going on in like the new world um and apparently there was a report back to the king at some point that they had gone to philadelphia and met a lovely family family called scrapple and it had a wonderful interesting dish called biddle that the person had gotten the names Got reversed oh wow so based on that, like when I married into the family, it was basically I had to deal with Scrapple. It's something I never had to deal with before in my life. But oh, I've man. learned to cook a proper Scrapple sandwich. I do like it when it's crispier. Yes. You know, there's there's lots of variations. And Jennifer, lab, you, we, just, you just went up a few points in my book. I'll tell you that so, right now. <laughs> well, in, in my lab, we have, um, we have a very international group, and we like to celebrate our differences. And so a couple times we've had dinners where the idea is like you bring something from your heritage um, as your, your meal that you bring. And I grew up in a family that's like Polish and German. And so I think I had brought like, you know, red cabbage with apples. And I, um, I don't know if actually, I brought kibasi at one point. Um, and then my husband, who's this like American mutt mostly because the Biddles have been here forever. is like, oh, I don't, I know. I'll make something with Scrapple. And it was around Thanksgiving. So he's very excited because he made um, scruffing. Basically he made Scrapple filled stuffing. <sighs> Um, yes. It was not healthy. It was not uh, healthy at all. But uh, down, very buddy. proud of himself on that one. Calm down. Oh, you got people. All <laughs> got me all excited. I love Scrapple, man. I, I had Scotch eggs for the first time, and, and I want to make them with Scrapple now. I want to like wrap an egg in Scrapple and then like coat it and deep fry it. Oh my god! Don't do that. Why? Why would you do that to an egg? <laughs> all right, all right enough, enough about my Scrapple fetish. All right. <laughs> No, extre not even an extreme file would live in Scrapple. I hope you know that when I have people come from from other countries and they come to my lab, like I make sure that they go to Surf Bagel and Lewis and I make sure that they order Scrapple and then we go back and we order, um, depends on where you grew up, whether it's Taylor Ham or Pork Roll. But like you have to try these local breakfast meats. Pork Roll is good really too. I like pork yeah. roll. I'll eat some pork roll. Look, I'll eat other nasty parts of a pig. <laughs> all right? I just want to eat the scrapple. <laughs> Draw I like line. Beer. I like, you know, just all the parts of the pig. But so You guys I might mean, appreciate that when we – so I did my grad school at Penn State, and when we lived there, we made friends with a guy, and it just so happened as he was elected to be the county coroner. And so it's weird to be friends with a coroner, right, because you're like, well, I know what to do at work, right? right. But we're sorry. Like, okay, I'm a scientist. We can deal with it. Well, it turns out his family had a pig farm. And every once in a while, they would, you know, off a pig. And then he'd ask everyone, like, do you guys want in on it? And so we just, like, without even thinking, we were like, oh, yeah, we'll take some pig. Well, yeah, we'll get, we'll make, and he was like, I'll make Scrapple. We're like, okay, we'll make some Scrapple, right? And it's everything but the oink. Yep. So we get mm. Scrapple, and it's, like, warm because it's freshly made, which was the first weird thing. Um, but, you know, we put it in the freezer and we pull it out once in a while. And at some point, I forget who was at our house, but we, like, cooked it for them. And they're like, oh, this scrapple's really good. Where'd you get it? And we're like, oh, the coroner. <laughs> <laughs> and they stopped eating. And we were like, oh, wait, we should have put more words in that <laughs> sentence. It's, it's a pig. Best. We trust it's a pig. It's right. a pig. It, right. Yeah. So. Oh, wow. That's awesome. All right, all right. <laughs> Enough about Scrabble. Well, uh, we, right, so, because I know we're going to be running short on time. I know Pete went get wants, wants to save time for the game, but I I also want to talk about tardigrades. I want to talk about water bears ahead, because they're ahead, my Mike. favorite thing in the world. It's a short game, Mike. We got a little time. All right. Okay. All right. So we'll do that. But first, I want to talk about uh, one thing because you had mentioned, and we 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 had mentioned it, and I had made it something in my notes about the um, extremophiles, and I wanted to know. Um, I was looking at something having to do with the thermophiles and the amount, the temperatures that they can live up to, which is like 
um, two, almost 200 degrees Celsius. It's almost oh. like in fire, you know, like in, in lava and stuff. So what, like, what mechanisms do these thermophiles have in 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 their structures that can prevent them, like their their DNA proteins, just from unraveling and just? You should take my class because I just taught this. All right, so a um, couple strategies that they use, and it's actually a really cool thing, is that one of the major things they use is there's this enzyme called reverse gyrase, um, and so I'm trying to actually here's one. I knew I had a rubber band around here somewhere. So imagine DNA, right? Roughly looks like yeah. this. And so in a cell, DNA starts coiling, mm -hmm. and it eventually folds in on itself so it can fit inside the cell. So this is DNA inside a cell. Um, so what reverse gyrase does is it actually makes it coil even more. So instead, it like overcoils the DNA. Ooh, it gets right? so, Yeah, so it's super tight here. Okay. And that is enough to keep it bonded at really high temperature. Um, so that it's a, it's a physical change in the way the DNA works, but the rest of the cell works the same. Um, the other really cool thing is that the lipids are a little bit different. So they basically allow for, um, if you think about like the way a membrane works, just to like super nerd out on you, is that it actually is in a sort of gel or it's more of a semi-solid state, but you have to avoid like if it gets too cold or too hot. If it's too hot, then everything just starts shifting around too much in it. So the membrane is slightly <laughs> shifted um, to, uh, to satisfy for that. And then... Um, the other interesting thing is that they do a little bit of bond stabilization in their proteins and that they, they're basically the same kinds of proteins. They just change out. Um, they added more glutamates in and that basically allows for more hydrogen bonds to get made in their protein structure. So that it helps hold the protein structure together. And there's a super cool story in there about like the way the protein structures work. Um, that basically, if you think about proteins are actually, they need to be pretty flexible to do catalysis. And so um, imagine that, you know, in a normal situation, they're held together by like maybe two big chunks. So when they start to unfold, it just like unfolds like that. But in a thermophile protein, they're actually going to sort of build into more like domain level chunks. So instead of like it would fall apart in like three or four big chunks that basically that they've, they've sort of nailed themselves together a little bit better. Um, and that helps survive the heat. So it's really interesting in terms of thinking of the way that proteins and enzymes work. Hmm. Very neat. Cool. Very, yeah. very neat. All right. All right. Um, good, Mike. You had, you had another one? Tardigrades. Let's talk yeah. about tardigrades. Right. Tardigrades, so, yeah. A lot of people know a little bit about them. Uh, and, and I know a little bit. I've, I've watched videos and I just get so fascinated with them. But what can you tell us from a, I guess, like an almost an evolutionary standpoint? Like, when do you think these, these bad boys hit the scene? Oh, I have no idea about that, actually. I would Google that. <laughs> but, but basically, so there are these organisms, right? And they, well, I mean, just think about it in general, right? The way an organism survives something like desiccation. Um, so we know that in the desert, lots of things survive in different ways in terms of how they're going to have handle this idea of like running out of water. And so in soil, so like tardigrades are water bears, they live in most soils. Um, and their big shtick is that they can survive desiccation. Um, so they can dry out and then they can get rehydrated and they come back to life. Um, so they survive the, the exposure to space because basically they can survive being desiccated. Um, and so evolutionarily, actually, so I mentioned there's controversy with them earlier. So there's this big issue because everyone thought like, oh, we're going to get some really great evolutionary information on it. And then they made the genome of the tardigrade. And it turns out it was massively contaminated. So initially the paper came out saying that they've got bacterial sequences in them and it must be this sort of hybrid organism between a bacteria and like a, a higher organism. And it turns out, no, it was just like the people screwed up and it was contaminated. And so then it was proved about a year later that for sure, like that was just an accident and like the lab, I don't know exactly what happened, but like the lab next to it was sequencing bacteria and their sequences got mixed up. Um, so it was kind of like a travesty for the age of genomics, um, but also a good learning experience in terms of recognizing contamination in a data set. Um, right. So there's really good papers that have come out on it recently, really showing how to look at this idea of how to put genes back together. Um, yeah, so that's all I know about tardigrades, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that, and they could, I think that what they've survived space, like they've come back from space. Um, yeah. there's probably there's, probably some sitting on the moon right now waiting to be uh, rehydrated yeah yep 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 and something to keep in mind is our planetary protection standards I don't know if they actually test for tardigrades so 
Really? We for sure, we try not to send poop bacteria to the moon, but, you know, we probably send a bunch of other stuff, too. So, well, I mean, how could um, you keep it off the outside of the space? You know, the ship is going up. Like, okay, we've cleaned everything off. Now we're going to launch it into space. Well, it's going to go through the atmosphere. You're going to pick stuff up on the way. There's just no way, if you get an extremophile on the outside of that ship, that you're going to be able to shake it off. It just It is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. And, and that's the, the truth of it. And actually, there's a lot of thought right now. Like, I served on a panel of experts for NASA about a year ago um, with this idea of, like, if we do get a sample, because right now NASA is la launching this Mars return mission, sample return mission, and that if we get a sample back, right, and if it looks the same, what are we going to make of it? And then the other question is, like, well, if it looks different, and how are we going to handle that? And so the nice thing is that we can do some experiments. Like, we can we could launch something and have it come right back down and see what it collected on it. Um, and so we could do some tests to really track what would be happening with what the sample contamination level would be. Um, people have come up with all sorts of theories about like setting stuff up there that would like imagine like a little robot pops out and then it like self sterilizes itself. So it cleans itself all off. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's the plan they went with, but, uh, but yeah. So Johnny five sprays himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. What was actually really crazy about that is could you get it to be like even enough to then allow the smoothness for like things like reentry become sort of an issue. So right. it became more of a mechanical engineering issue than, than like a theoretical issue. So Yeah. All right. Um, All right. Mr. Uh, Big Daddy Spence, who's uh, one of our uh, our uh, regulars, is asking, do you do any kind of work on the Mars research on microbes? Um, okay, so for Mars Research on Microbes, um, I'm tangentially involved in that I've been funded through the NASA Astrobiology Program. Um, again, like I served as an expert on this Mars Sample Return uh, panel, and so I'm always sort of involved with it. Um, I haven't done anything more intense at this point. We have some people that are making like fake Martian soils and then seeing if things would live in them um, and running through like the theoretical calculations of might be, what might be happening there, but I haven't necessarily dove into it that much yet. Okay. Now, so uh, there's something I've been wanting to get into, and I want to get into this mic before we go too long. So if there's anything else you want to get in, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a chunk of, of information I picked up. I, it was a book I read that touches on a lot of stuff you talked about, and I wanted to get into it just a little bit. So uh, did you have any other questions, Mike, before I, I... – Is there anything uh, interesting about bubble algae that it's, it, it can get so big as a one-celled organism real quick? Or is it just like – There's yeah. lots of cool things. I mean, bubble algae, slime mode, mold, stick to stelium. Like, it's just crazy how much uh, goes on in terms of biology. I mean – so. Bubble algae. It's whatever you see there that a huge, like, big thing that I've seen, like, you know, there's some YouTube videos that just show really big bubble algae. That is one cell. That is a one-celled organism. Each bubble, so that's just fascinating to me. Pete, please okay. ask your question. Right. <laughs> so, I read this just recently, and it was interesting because you you touched on some of this during the, the panel talk, and then I happened to read this book, which I had no intentions of like I I had no idea it would touch on anything that you were talking about, but it was by a guy named Louis Dartnell, and it's a book called Origins, and it has a lot to do with um, the book is about how um, uh, natural phenomena and, and, and geology have shaped how animals and us have, have lived and where we went and you know how life formed based upon the geology. And one of the things I found out from that book was that oil is not made out of dinosaurs. It's not made out of dinosaurs. It's, I mean, there might be a little bit of dinosaur in it, but not really. It's it actually made out of plankton, small plants, and bacteria and mostly from the Mesozoic age, because of something that was going on during that time period. I'm not going to get into it because it, you'd have to read the whole chapter on that. But um, one of the things was these uh, coccolithophores mm -hmm. uh, that make limestone. And there's this uh -huh. weird like duality that they have with CO2 in that CO2 goes up and coccolithophore populations go up and they make limestone, which is down in, you know, it sinks down to the bottom of the ocean. But then as CO2 goes up, the water becomes more pH heavy and that dissolves the CO2 in the limestone. So what, what is going on there? How, how, what is that relationship? And do we have to worry about that? Because the ocean is getting a little more pH-y. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, that's awesome that you le read Lewis's book because um, I had met him. I think he was still a PhD student and um, I met him in Edinburgh at a conference once for the UK Center for Astrobiology. So shout out to my UK friends from nice. Astrobiology. Okay. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, that's awesome that you read his book. So, okay, yeah, so coccolithophores, it, oh man, it's a really interesting thing because um, when we think about carbon cycling, we can think about like the, the average carbon cycle, right? Which is like 
carbon if it gets fixed by a plant, the plant dies, it goes into the soil, it gets eaten, and then eventually it comes out as methane or CO2. Um, and that's the short-term carbon cycle. But there's a long-term carbon cycle too. It involves things like massive growth of things that are making carbonate in the ocean, like a coccolithophore, and then they deposit it down deep. Um, eventually that can go and subduct into a tectonic, um, tectonically active area and you know eventually comes out through a volcano and so there's co2 release that come through the volcanoes and to think about this sort of long-term carbon cycling in terms of involving things like calcifying organisms is a huge deal um, but you're right ph starts dissolving that and it gets harder for the organisms to live and so first answer to that is that ph isn't you know when we think about ph it's like dissolved but the ocean is actually different so um the way the ocean works, there's going to be some refugia places where the pH would be amenable to letting these organisms live. Okay. So there usually are like areas in the ocean that can hide away. Um, it's actually a really interesting story in Washington state right now, because one of the most impactful talks I ever heard on climate change was from an oyster um, farmer. And he was talking about how the oysters can't make shells when the pH drops too low. And mm -hmm. so he's actually, he instrumented the entire estuary around his oyster factory to then monitor the pH and they don't put the oyster spat out if the pH drops too low. And then they put the oyster spat out, right? And oysters are able to then pull down uh, carbonate too when they're making their shells. So there's this whole game to play. Um, but yeah, it is this like sort of terror inducing thing when you th start thinking about this idea of like super uncontrolled CO2 re release, right? Is that, then that's what we're in right now. And CO2 is going into the ocean, it changes the pH. So eventually, it's not only are the animals going to be able to stop making their shells, but all of the calcium carbonate. And if you just think, actually, a friend of mine just went to this town in Georgia, and like their beach is completely shells. It's the sediment called coquina, and it basically is just shells, is like the bottom of that you're walking on, like it's not sand. Um, all of that can dissolve, like it's all dissolvable. So if we change pH that drastically, there's gonna be this tipping point where all of a sudden, not only are shells no longer a place to hide carbon, but it's a place to actively get carbon from if it's dissolving. So it's a reason we need to be paying attention um, and hope that people come up with some solutions to scrub carbon because this is something that's gonna affect the ocean long-term. Right. Um, the great thing about biology is that there's always something out there and we have some organisms that are able to do things at higher pHs. There's some other systems that have been studied. Um, some of the species hopefully would be divergent enough to be able to survive. So there's some hope that things would continue on, but it would have a drastic extinction and, and sort of a birth of a new species uh, in terms of what's dominant. Yeah, some, something will jump in its place. Oh, look at all this open water. You know, <laughs> I will grow yeah. here. And I think, oh, God, I hope we can eat that because uh, <laughs> we're going to need to. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and this is like, I, I have to say, I'm so proud because I just got this published in an open on, open access book on um, deep carbon, actually. I actually got published the uh, the line, I think I, I think I wrote it, as, as they say in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that phrase gets uttered a lot in my laboratory because basically it describes extremophiles, it describes climate change, is that life's going to find a way um, and not just, you know, making Indominus Rex that kills everyone, but right. that, that, you know, life is going to hopefully find a way and that there's always some variant that'll get through. Awesome, awesome. All right. Uh, unless there's anything else, Mike, we have a game to play. Let's do it. All right. We, All right. we do. We have we have a bunch of other questions, but we'll never get to them. So <laughs> anyway, we'll have to have you back on. Um, all right. So before we go to the game, though, everybody, make sure you check out www.ceoe.udel.edu forward slash our dash people forward slash profiles forward slash JF Biddle, or you could just click the link in the show notes. It'd be a lot easier yeah. that way. And <laughs> feel free to visit me on social media. I'm at subsurface underscore life on Twitter. And then I'm at Jen B one, two, three on Instagram. Instagram is okay. way more boring than Twitter though. Cause I have to say, I like, I do better with conversation, not just images, but anyway. Right, right, right. Yeah. But I'm working the on Instagram stuff game. you do would have so many cool images. Your Instagram account would be awesome. It really could be. If think I actually it. remember to take pictures yeah, and like, did something, you know, but I do think the last Instagram post I had was me making pasta sauce. So, you know, it's, you get everything. Right, right. There's right. no filtering. I mean, imagine pictures from like the salt mine, you know, like, the, like walking under the the salt mine and like it, the water starts coming out. You take a picture. Hey, look, we're about to die. You know, like, that was like one time, but like five years ago. So I know. I don't I'm, know just saying, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All right, let's Mike. Let's oh, play with it. Where, where, and and who is it that we could look up to try and find? Like on um, uh, Facebook again. I want to write his name. Tim down Weaver. Like, oh, so Timothy Weaver. Yeah, I actually I was just trying to get through my email and find a link. I know there's something on YouTube, um, but I haven't I haven't found it yet. So sorry. 
Okay. Right, well. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, hey, everybody. It's game time with the Mythwits. I'll be your game master this week. And, and this week, we're playing This or That Evolution Edition. So what we're going to do, Mike, this is a this, this or that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two things to pick from, and you have to pick one of them. If you get it right, you get the point. If not, well, you get nothing. Um, and what we're going to do is I've picked several living things, and you're going to tell me which one is the oldest evolutionarily. So, um, and I've got the dates down here, and I've got them all picked out. Uh, I'm going to make Mike go first because, uh, you know... Because that's that's how we roll, yeah. right, Mike? <laughs> that's how we roll. And just so you know, we always have a winner because if you and Mike tie, ties go to the guest. So you got you got you got a little bit of a hedge there. And and being that you're actually you know an expert in biology, you probably got a this little bit of nothing. got a little bit of an edge <laughs> on Mike. I don't know. We'll see. All right, here we go. All right, so Mike. Your first mm -hmm. category is, or your first two two choices are, uh, and I'm gonna. So you're each gonna guess, but I'm gonna I'm make Mike guess first, and then you're gonna guess, and then uh, we'll switch it up. Uh, so Mike, what do you think came first, the crocodile, and this is a modern day crocodile, so the crocodile that you have seen. How many million? I'm, you don't have to tell me how many millions of years ago, but did it come first, or did the cockroach come first? Who's older, the crocodile or the cockroach? Wow. Hmm. Um, right now, what I'm envisioning is a uh, a crocodile or a crocodile, which I mean, don't 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 start picturing that one. Um, let me see. Oh God. Uh, I, oh wow. Did you say crocodile? Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. I'm sorry. A crocodile sure. or a uh, crocodile. Um. Anyway. Um. You know, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say that uh, it's the uh, crocodile. Okay, so Mike says crocodile. All right. Uh, this is so weird. So our stream, we're going to keep going because we're recording local anyway, but something happened with our stream on Facebook. It'll pick up, whatever. All right. Um, so what do you say, Jennifer? What do you think, crocodile or cockroach? I would go with crocodile, too. You're going to go with crocodile, too. Okay. Well, no, I'm sorry, but you both. Don't go with Mike. Don't. It, <laughs> the crocodile is only 55 million years old. The cockroach, 200 million really? years old. Yeah, old, they are Amazing. old, long lived. All right. Uh, Jennifer, you're going to go first on this one. Sharks or pterosaurs? So pterodactyls or sharks? Pterosaurs. Yes. Yeah, that's my vote. Oh, pterosaurs. Okay. Mike, what do you think? Sharks or pterosaurs? Hmm. I'm going to say sharks because they had, they, they've been in the water longer. All right. And, uh, we all know. Well, Mike, you actually got that one right. 510 huh. million years they've been around. Pterosaurs only right. 215 million years old. That's I was really surprised by that shark number. I knew they were old, but good Lord. All right, so Mike, you got one point. How many million years? Five hundred and ten million years. That's a that's a that's a little bit of time there. Now I'm I'm no you know, I I got these off the internet so and I did my best to get them right. So if there are a little long, I, I did my best. All right, <laughs> so Mike, you're up. The Tyrannosaurus Rex or T Rex as they like to call them or redwood trees. I'm going to go with redwood trees. All right, Mike goes with redwood trees. Jennifer, what do you think? T-Rex or redwoods? Uh, I don't really know, but I will go against Mike just to be devil's advocate and say T-Rex. <laughs> oh, man. Mike. Man, are you? <gasps> no way. Redwoods have been around 240 million years. Yeah. The T-Rex, only 84 million years old. Just this is the problem with learning everything you know about dinosaurs from Dinosaur Train on PBS. Yes. Thanks, Scott Sampson. <laughs> All right. Seriously, that's where I learned it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so, so Jennifer, you're up. Oh, wait a minute, did you go? Wait a minute, so it was a mic. Jennifer, Mike. Je yeah, Jennifer. All right. All right. Yeah, Jennifer, I'm going to give you a. I'm going to. I'm going to go out and give you a little bit of advice. This is. I'm going to share my game theory with you. Okay. Whichever one sounds more likely, 
is the I wrong answer. Yeah. I go with the opposite. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Good luck. <laughs> Grass or dragonflies? Oh my god. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I should not have said anything. I apologize. <laughs> Grass or dragonflies? No. Well, is it me or is it Jennifer first? Oh, it's Jennifer. I, don't know, I hope it's you. Damn, okay. it's me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, going on Mike's game theory, I'm going to pick grass because that sounds way more boring than a dragonfly. Okay, Mike. <laughs> oh, it's going to be dragonfly. <laughs> now, I would have said, yeah, grass seems so ubiquitous. It's been around forever. But the dragonfly has been around since Forever the sh- yeah. at least, you know what I mean? Since I at mean, least the time of the sharks and we've established they're old, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with dragonflies. All right, Mike goes with dragonflies. Dragon. You know how old dragons are? Just, you know? Mike, <laughs> grass, oh grass is only 55 million years old. The crocodile is as old as the crocodile. T Rexes did not walk on grass. They did not pee on grass. There was no grass. No grass existed. They didn't know what it was like to have their little yeah. little T Rex feet. Little T Rex feet running around. Um, dragonflies are 300 million years old. I suck at this game. All right. <laughs> we're going to get a little. All right. So here we go. Now we're going to get a little more more modern. This is the, uh, the last two are domestication. It's the domestication rounds. The last two. Oh. All right. Mike, you're up first. Right, Mike, yeah, Mike, yeah, Mike, yeah, okay. Uh, Mike, what was domesticated first, the dog or the cat? Oh, uh, crap. <laughs> crap, crap, crap. I mean, you know, you don't see any dog sphinx, but... Uh... My dog sphinx, man. When it's in here... <laughs> <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> I'm going to go with, oh, this time I'm going with my gut. Uh, Dog. Dog. Okay, Mike goes dog. Jennifer? Um, I would like to argue that your answer is impossible because we, in fact, have not domesticated cats. They've domesticated us. Well, okay, fair enough, fair enough. But <laughs> what, what the internet would say. <laughs> that's, that's, I, I, I agree. I have, I have three cats that have domesticated me. Yeah, you know yeah. the difference between a dog yeah. and a cat is? You pet a dog, you love them, you feed them, they think you're a god. You do the same thing for a cat, and it thinks it's a god. Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right, well, just to be a naysayer, Mike's a dog, I'll say cat. All right. Mike, you're killing it, man. Dog, 13,000 years ago. If that pre- was more agreeable, I'd be doing better. Pre-civilization, <laughs> they go back to tribal, like, just, like, you know, hunter-gatherers. Cats, 8,000, they go back, you're right, Eight, what are the dogs? How far Thir- back? Thirteen thousand might be longer. Thirteen. Okay. Fair, there's error bars on that. There are some error bars on these, but yeah, that that was the ex- the sort of accepted number right now. They they think maybe as far back as fifteen five, but I just I was conservative. I went with thirteen. All right, last one. Hey, Mike. Can we can we make this one worth five points? Sure. <laughs> it's okay. I will lose happily. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. I never do this good, I swear to God. He really doesn't. He's just terrible. I said I'm doing that bad, Mike. Come on. I, no, I baby <laughs> made my way out on this game, okay? These, I really did. So These, these are we, all guesses, I, I, and I yeah. knew they would be. All right. I, I, I had to research all this. I didn't know any of this. All right. Yeah. Mike? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. You went first last time, right? Nope, nope, yep, yep. Jennifer okay. gets to Jennifer, go first. Jennifer, chicken? Not going to help at all. Or pig? <laughs> Oh, no, you re- that is mean. That is so mean, Pete. <laughs> right? Chicken or pig? Why? Yeah. What was des- domesticated first, the chicken or the pig? Uh, I don't know. Hmm. I've actually learned a lot about chicken domestication, but not I didn't really pay attention right. to the date. <laughs> Nobody does. Nobody knows. Ah. Yeah. Uh... I'm gonna go with pig. Pig. All right, Jennifer goes with pig. Mike. Chicken or the pig? Which came first, the chicken or the pig? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, chicken or the pig? Uh, you know what? Uh, just to give Jennifer a game theory chance, I'm gonna go with. Wait, wait, she, what did she go with? Pig. I said pig. I'm gonna go with chicken. Chicken. All right. Hey, I'm, Jennifer. I'm, I'm, I'm you wrong. didn't get skunked. 
You're right, pig. 9,000 years ago, the chicken wasn't domesticated until just 6,000 years ago. Yeah. So, and domesticated from the red jungle fell, which I learned a lot about. Oh, There's nice. this fantastic uh, uh, doc documentary on it about chickens, anyway. And then Frank Perdue got also a, a fantastic of documentary called Chicken People. You need to watch it. Chicken People? Chicken People. Oh, yeah. It's, it's about people who raise chickens? And Amazon. Oh, oh, show chickens. Oh, no, Everyone no. Watch this show chickens. Chicken People. It is just, oh my gosh, it makes you cry. Like, it's a fantastic documentary. <laughs> show chickens. It'll make you cry. Spence says the uh, quote of the night is my dog Sphinx. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, he does. Yes, he does. All right. All right well, congrats, Mike. Mike. Nicely done. Mike. Here you go, Mike. God, I, I, I'm sorry. It's okay. Mike, do you? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it takes his lap. Sorry. I, I so lucky. <laughs> what can I tell you? Right, right. All right, everybody. Well, that's it for us tonight. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was fantastic. Um, Thanks for having me. Everybody Mike, in the next room. Time I see you. I will give you a narwhal. Okay. Oh, thank cool. You for winning. Yes. Thank you. All Every right. <laughs> I'm, I'm to do it. We have, we will try and circle around Delaware at some point. So that's you know, I didn't I didn't read all of these, but there was a lot of some of them here. Uh, one person, I think, uh, one person was saying, "Oh my God, she's so interesting. She's so smart." And so you had some fans. So it's good. Yeah, but I just lost to Mike. Everyone. So yeah, I'm it's good a dumb, deep time. Going. It's a it's a dumb that game was, I made up. Yeah. Don't don't worry about that. Fifty percent. <laughs> right. All right. Let's do the thing. Um, everybody make sure you go check out the link in the show notes uh, and let's do the b -b 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 closer here we go you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits if you don't have time for videos make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher do the like follow subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet I'm going to tell you right now this is a contestant for being one of our better shows. I'm telling you, this was a good one. Very, very entertaining. Uh, tweet us at MythWits and check out MythWits.com. MythWits is uh, part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows like, hey, Cube of Death, the show where industry guests go head-to-head -head in an RPG adventure using geek trivia questions to resolve actions. That's mine. Uh, MythWits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it, don't change it, and don't use it as a crutch for actual knowledge. Mike and I are idiots. Go read a book. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike. Fossils of tardigrades have been found dated back to the Cambrian period 500 million years ago around the same time as sharks.